Yeah. So in this video, we're going to talk about Aeschylus's play Persians. Um, so this is a really unique play in the canon of surviving Greek tragedy uh, for a couple of important reasons. One is that, as far as, far as I know, uh, this is the only surviving play from ancient Greece that takes place entirely outside of Greece itself, uh, or, or Greek-speaking areas. So the entire action of this play is set in Persia, in, in the city of Susa, um, which was the capital of, of Persia at this time. Um, the other reason that this play is significant is because Unlike almost every other surviving tragedy, it deals with current events, more or less current events. So this play is set shortly after the Battle of Salamis in 480. The play premieres in 472, so about eight years after the battle itself took place. Um, and so Aeschylus's audience would have known uh, about the Battle of Salamis, and many of them would have participated. Indeed, uh, Aeschylus himself fought the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, and probably fought them at Salamis as well. So this is this was sort of first-hand experience for Aeschylus as a writer. Um, it'd be sort of like uh, a playwright setting. Uh, a, 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 an American playwright uh, setting a play that premieres in 1949 immediately after uh, in the, the, the uh, Japanese high command immediately after say the Battle of Iwo Jima like a lot of the people who would have seen this play would have been very familiar with the events depicted and we actually get quite a good description of the battle. Um, there's a, a scene where a messenger has come in. The opening portion is uh, the chorus and Atosa, who's the, the queen of Persia, uh, Darius the Great's widow, mother of Xerxes, the current Persian king. Um, the opening portion of the play is then the chorus and, and Atosa basically being uncertain about the fate of this uh, expedition, this Persian expedition to conquer Greece, or more specifically to conquer Athens. And then this messenger comes in, and along with the sort of general bad news about defeat, he gives a very detailed account of the Battle of Salamis. Like, an extremely detailed account, the kind of thing that you would expect a veteran of the Battle of Salamis to incorporate into uh, a play about it. So basically what happened at Salamis, um, the Persians under King Xerxes had both come across, up, they'd come up through what's now uh, Turkey, through sort of the Constantin, what's now um, Istanbul, uh, what was it at the time Byzantium, they came up through uh, up across the Bosphorus um, and around to Greece on foot. But then they also sent a large navy from uh, the Persian Empire uh, to attack Greece directly. So what happened, uh, Salamis was a naval battle. The Greeks sent somebody, sent a deserter to Xerxes' camp to basically say, hey, here's where all of the Greek ships are. Uh, in the morning, they're going to try and flee through this area, uh, the Straits of Salamis, which is, was a very uh, comparatively small, comparatively narrow uh, strip between mainland Greece and an and island. And so what this uh, Greek deserter suggested to Xerxes was that Xerxes locate his much larger navy across that narrow strait so that he could catch the Greeks as they as their ships tried to flee. And Xerxes, who was not 
necessarily the most cunning military strategist in the world, sort of said to himself, yeah, that checks out, and I am not at all going to question your story or why you would have deserted to come tell me this. So he put his fleet precisely where the Greeks wanted him to. What uh, the Greeks then did was they attacked the Persian fleet, and because the Persians had a lot of ships crammed into a relatively small area, they weren't really able to maneuver. And so the Greeks attacked and basically created chaos. Um, and so in, then in their attempt to flee, the Persian ships started crashing into one another and sinking one another. So basically, uh, Xerxes starts out with this massive fleet, tons and tons and tons of soldiers from all over the Persian Empire, and they're basically just wiped out. Um, and so we get this, again, in very, very thorough detail uh, over the course of this, uh, of this messenger's speech. So, Uh, again, this is a, a very important uh, sort of element in terms of how sorry, I'm losing my place a little bit. Sorry, so this is a very important element in terms of how Aeschylus approaches this storytelling. And again, it's all it, it's pretty much unique among surviving Greek plays and I think as far as we know from fragments and records of, of plays that are now lost it's almost unique amongst the canon of Greek tragedy in general uh, because almost everything else is about mythical stories so that being said there's a couple of things that are really really interesting here uh, to me now, I'm going to start with one that I think is, is important, but it just sort of gets a passing mention, um, or gets a couple of passing mentions. Aeschylus was an Athenian patriot. He was proud of being Athenian. Again, he served in the Athenian military. He fought the Persians. Um, and so, at one point, we have this exchange between Atosa and the chorus leader. And again, Atosa is the queen of Persia. She is, she is part of an autocratic monarchy. Uh, so she's asking about Athens, and she says, but who herds the man flock? Who lords the army? The chorus leader says, they're not anyone's slaves or subjects. Atosa then asks, then how can they resist invaders? And the chorus leader says, so well that they crushed Darius's huge and shining army. So we've got this really just sort of passing endorsement of democracy in this line that they're not anyone's slaves the Athenians are not anyone's slaves or subjects this idea of Athenian freedom Athenian democracy Athenian self-rule as not only ethically but militarily superior to Persian autocracy so that's a really interesting point that that uh, Aeschylus gives us one of the other things that I find really fascinating um, is the emphasis on the diversity of the Persian forces. So there's an element of this that's actually a little bit tedious because there are three, four instances where uh, the chorus either just sort of doing choral uh, choral odes and things like that, or in talking to other characters, whether that's Atosa or Xerxes uh, or whoever it is, they give these sort of long lists of names of commanders and descriptions of the kind of, of uh, units that they led, whether they were infantry, whether they were cavalry, whether they were archers, whatever it is. And so we get several long lists, which is a bit tedious. But one of the things that's really very interesting to me is, again, we have this emphasis on the diversity of the Persian Empire. And one of the things maybe to keep in mind is that today in the West, we have this sort of shining vision of ancient Greece, or more specifically of ancient Athens, 
as sort of white columns and everybody uh, being philosophers and, and, and uh, poets and scientists and things like this. And when we, tend, when we think about Persia at all, we tend to think of them more as a sort of Middle Eastern, yeah, they were, yeah, whatever, kind of backwards, not really on the level of the Greeks. In the 5th century, in the 6th century BCE, Persia was the regional superpower, and the Greeks were more, much more so, were a sort of loose confederation, not really a confederation, they were a, they were a, a loose group of largely independent city-states who shared a similar language and religious beliefs. Persia was much, much, much bigger, much more organized, much more centralized. Um, and so, just from this first choral song where they discuss the forces that have been sent to conquer Athens, uh, we have references to, to the key cities of the Persian Empire, Susa, Ekbatana, and Kisa. Uh, we also have again, an extensive list of the names of generals and the types of, of forces they command. Uh, we have references to people from Egypt, both from the city of Memphis and from the city of Thebes. That's Egyptian Thebes, not uh, Greek Thebes. Uh, we have references to Lydians. We have references to uh, Mycenaeans. We have references to Babylonians. Um, and so that that's a really interesting thing because again we've got we've got this sense that Persia is a cosmopolitan empire in much the same way that that Rome later would be, um, and so that's a really interesting point. And one possible sort of counter interpretation we could make of that is the assumption that Greece was homogenous, but actually it wasn't. Um, and that's a really important point that contemporary classicists often stress, is that Greece was also multicultural. Um, they had, in, in cities like Athens, Corinth, Argos, Thebes, they had people from uh, not only other city-states, but they had people from Persia. They had people from uh, Phoenicia. They had people from Cana. They had people from Egypt. Uh, they had people from uh, the Black Sea region. So the ancient Near East, the ancient Eastern Mediterranean, was an extremely diverse region. So the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of Persians is the importance of fate and divination. Now, this is, these are really crucial things in Greek tragedy in general, and we get them very strongly in Persians. Um, so, in the first sort of choral song, we have these two stanzas. Uh, but how crafty the scheme of God, what mere man outleaps it, what human foot jumps fast enough to tear loose from its sudden grip. For with gestures of kindness as bait, blind folly fawns a man into her net, nor can he hope to work loose and escape unhurt. So we've got this clear um, evocation of the concept of fate, which again really uh, drives Greek tragedy. It's really central. This idea that the gods lay down a person's fate and there's no way to escape it that anything that you do to attempt to escape it will actually drive you headlong into your fate. We've also got these really detailed descriptions of, of divin divination and um, attempts to predict the future. So when Atosa first comes in, um, she gives this fairly lengthy speech. Um, it's about... It's almost 70 lines. 
speaks, she gives this very lengthy speech telling about uh, these two dreams that she had. And dreams were believed to be prophetic or to, to be uh, significant. In the first dream, there are two very tall, splendid women, uh, one of whom uh, was identified, uh, one of whom is dressed like a Persian, the other of whom is dressed like a Greek. And her son Xerxes tries to yoke these two women to pull his, his chariot. And uh, the Persian woman sort of meekly submits and, and pulls the chariot. The Greek woman uh, resists, and she she rips out the uh, the yoke. She rips out the reins from the chariot, and she knocks it to the ground. She basically destroys this chariot. Um, the other thing that happens, actually, the second thing is not a dream, but it, it, it's a prophetic omen. Um, and Greeks were big into birds as giving prophetic omens. So she says she's going to Phoebus's altar, so that's Apollo, uh, as, as most people will know. Um, and she sees an eagle fleeing. Uh, she sees an eagle flying toward the, the altar of Apollo when it's attacked by a hawk. And the hawk claws the eagle's brain, basically, it just claws it in the, in the head. And the eagle doesn't resist, he doesn't fight back or anything like this. Uh, he just submits to being killed. And then the last element of uh, divination, magic, or sort of Persian mysticism, maybe, uh, that I want to talk about for this play um, is when the chorus at Atosa raise the specter of Darius the Great. So uh, Darius is Xerxes' father, he's dead. He's, uh, he was Atosa's husband. Uh, he basically they they perform a ritual and they bring his ghost back from the underworld where it's uh, where it's currently residing. And basically they they seek uh, Darius's counsel about what the defeat means and what Persia can do about it. And essentially, Darius's answer is um, the Persians lost because of uh, Xerxes's hubris. And this is another crucial principle of Greek tragedy, is this idea of hubris, or of setting yourself up pridefully against the gods. Um, and so the thing that seems to be one of the, the key elements here is that in order to get his troops across the Bosphorus Strait, uh, Xerxes basically created a, a, a temporary bridge over the strait. And because the Bosphorus was a holy strait, a holy, a holy uh, waterway, the gods took this as a big insult. And so for that reason, for Xerxes' overconfidence, uh, they punished the Persians by having, uh, by allowing the Greeks to destroy the navy, to destroy the army, and then having the remnants of the army essentially starve on the way back to Persia.